What's up guys, Senator Lifestyle. I'm gonna continue the saga of the never ending tire carrier build. Today's episode is brought to you by Empire Abrasives. All the cutoff wheels, grinding discs, flap discs, even the belts for my belt sander came from Empire Abrasives, and I cannot stress enough how much money you save whenever you shop with an online company like this. Before I found Empire, I would pretty much run my supplies down to next to nothing, and then in the middle of the project, I'd have to run out to Home Depot or whatever local hardware store was open in hopes that I could get what I needed without getting ripped off. By ordering online, I never have to leave my house and I can keep my supplies stocked without having to break the bank. If you're shopping around for abrasive products for your next project, make sure you check out Empire. And if you wanna save even more money, use coupon code DIRTLIFESTYLE at checkout. And if it's your first time there, you will save an additional 10%. In the last episode of this series, we built some corner armor, we shored up the bumper, and we talked about ways to try and get rid of some of the wiggle on the tire carrier itself. In today's video, I wanna start with what I think is the crown jewel of this entire project, and that is the overlanding tabletop that's gonna mount onto the swing out portion of this tire carrier. So we can latch it open like that. We're gonna be able to set a tabletop down and anchor it in tightly onto this carrier, and it's gonna give us a bunch of extra table space. So there's a bunch of different changes that I've thought about and I wanna make since the last video, but before we get to all that, I wanna bend and dimple die and build this tabletop. There's a lot of different ways that I can build and mount the tabletop for this, but I think the easiest way is gonna to be to make it removable. I'm essentially gonna build a couple of stainless steel studs, drill some holes in them for some linch pins, and that way I can just slide it on and off without tools, and I can just pin it up to make sure that my kids don't knock it off or anything like that. Welcome to my little camp kitchen. I have been visualizing this for a long time. And the reason that I've been visualizing it in this way is it just seems so practical to have everything very easy to just flip down and be ready to go. So if I show up to camp, I open up and I lock the tire carrier and then I just open up this door. I drop down these two tables and then I mount this one table and I'm ready to go. I mean, this kitchen is a very quick setup. It's lightweight because this is just 3 16 aluminum. Um, same thing with the stuff on the back door. And I don't have to clutter up the uh, interior of this because of the way I stow all of these different surfaces. So these are very obvious because they're hinged. They just fold up out of the way and that's sweet, right? This, however, does not operate in the same way and I'll tell you why I did why I did it this way instead of have it hinged if this was hinged like those two other uh, tabletops over there then that means that this is going to be permanently on the outside of the cab and that's going to make it very dirty every time I need to use it I'm going to have to uh, basically just unsnap two latches it drops down and that's great that I have such convenience but this thing is going to be so nasty every time I need to use it covered in mud and dust and exhaust and all that so stowing this away inside the cab, I think is much more practical. I wanted to be able to do it without tools. So I just use these linchpins to hold it in place. Super simple, right? Another way that I could have mounted this that I'm sure people will bring up is if I just built a little channel onto the back of this and then I put, uh, you know, I just welded a small chunk of aluminum on the back of this guy. I could have just slid that down into that channel. But the problem with that is that that's gonna get covered in dirt and filled with mud and everything else too, meaning that I have to clean that channel out every single time I wanna use the table. So I think that two linchpins makes this very easy to pull on and off, and I bet I can even do it one-handed. I haven't tried yet. Oh, there we go, comes right off. And super lightweight, you know? I, I, I think that this is very practical to have this setup. So let me set that down. 
The way that I want to stow this so it's not cluttering up the cab is I'm going to replace this rear window with a piece of aluminum. I can't see out of the window anyway. It's going to be much more functional as a place for me to mount and store things than it is for it to be a window at this point because clearly you can't see <laughs> through any of that. So what I want to do is I want to mount this up in the rear window and then I'm going to also have some other things in the future that I'm going to add to this rear window making it a really nice place to store stuff out of the way. If you look, there's quite a bit of space from where the window starts and you know where this starts to intrude into the cab space. So this is a great place to stow some extra lightweight um, goods and some different things like this. So now that we have the tabletop made and I just feel like we're making progress, I'm ready to move on to the next step. The next step of this build is something that I knew was gonna happen from the get-go. I knew that I was gonna have an issue with how flimsy this tire was gonna feel as you drive down the trail. I've had a tire carrier in the past that was built very similar to this, and it was something that I actually had bought from a company, and I never liked how much movement I had the tire. So I've been thinking about this for months of a way that I can shore that up enough to where it doesn't wiggle, and I think I have some ideas. I've got a few different things that I wanna smooth out and engineer around, before I remove that rear window and replace it with a big sheet of aluminum and start adding extra accessories. The first one's gonna be relatively easy. I don't like the way this looks. I don't like the way these gussets turned out on the sides, so I'm just gonna buzz those tack welds, pop them off, and I'll save those for a future project. For now, I am going to, I guess not for now, for good, hopefully, I am going to take and bend a piece that, that's gonna kinda go at like a 45 degree angle um, with an extra dimple in it. I think it's gonna match that center part really well. So it's just gonna kind of spruce up the way this looks and make, make it all blend a little bit better. The second problem, which is the biggest one, of course, is the amount of wiggle we have in the rear tire. Um, this design with this spindle is inherently wiggly, especially if you have a 37, something heavy like that. We've got it really high, which gives a lot of extra leverage, which is not good for our problem, but we actually don't have a whole lot of wiggle in the carrier itself. A lot of this wiggle is actually coming from the bumper and it's going to work its way out once I can turn a bunch of those tack welds into solid through welds. It's gonna solidify that corner and help out a ton. However, the third problem that we need to deal with is whether or not I'm gonna have enough strength long-term where the tube, where the round tube connects to our rectangular tube. And I don't think that this would be a problem long-term, but imagine if it was. We're talking about pretty catastrophic stuff here. If it ended up forming a crack around the top of that weld, and this tire ends up coming off the back of the carrier, that's a huge problem. So I wanna make sure that that is not possible. I wanna make sure that that is something that we can fix right now and we don't have to worry about moving forward. A lot of you guys made suggestions. I mean, I probably have a couple hundred of the same suggestion, which is, drill some holes through the square tube and then run the round tube into it and then re-weld it. Unfortunately, that's not gonna work for our situation and I wanna explain why. The potential failure point that we could have is not gonna be influenced on in whether or not this round tube penetrates down into the rectangular tube because the weld itself is actually stronger than the two parent materials that we are welded to. So what does that mean? That means that if it's welded correctly, you will very rarely ever see a weld fail. Even if you, I mean, if you saw someone who designed some crazy ultra four rig and they go bombing through the desert and they get in a crazy wreck and a whole bunch of tube gets torn apart, you will never see the welds rip apart. It's always the material cracks around the weld. And that is exactly how this would fail. So whether or not we have a butt weld, which is what we have, we just took the round tube, we butt welded it to the rectangular tube, or if you, drill a hole, you send the material all the way down in, into the, um, the rectangular tubing, we're still gonna have a failure in the exact same point because this doesn't have any influence on what happens up here. All that wiggle and all that leverage is not gonna wear out the weld because the weld is stronger than the two parent materials that we are welding to, and it's not going to break the rectangular tube because the rectangular tube is thicker than our round tube. So the crack is gonna slowly start to form, if it did form, above that weld. And so that is what we are trying to um, figure out a clever way to engineer through. Now, there's a couple different ways we go about this. We could shore it up with a bunch of gussets, and we did use a couple of gussets, and they would help a little bit. But the best way to do this is to add a third mount. So right now we have these two mounts, basically. Um, one is the spindle, the other one is the latch. Both of them are pretty strong 
but because of the extra weight we have up here and the extra leverage we have up here, all of that movement on all those giant bumps and heck, even if you're just hitting big potholes on the freeway going 70 miles an hour, that's gonna have a lot of influence on these welds. So what we need, the best way to move forward is not gonna be to do, do anything with what we already have installed. It is gonna be to try to add strength by adding a third mount. This is a lot more complicated than it sounds, adding a third mount up there because you don't wanna have to like bear hug this big 37 to unlatch something behind it every time you want to swing open the tire carrier. But I've thought about this a lot over the last couple weeks and I think I have a pretty cool idea that I wanna explore. This problem is gonna take a lot of creative thinking and some compromise in order for us to overcome, but it's definitely doable. I am not satisfied with the amount of wiggle that we have and I wanna do everything I can to counteract that wiggle. And I just, we have to have a second latch that's gonna go behind this tire carrier. Now we could just mount another one of these latches behind the tire carrier and that would be strong and it would definitely keep it from wiggling, but I don't wanna have to reach around this giant 37 inch tire in order to unlatch that secondary latch. So right now we undo this and we can open it. But what I'm proposing is that we install a secondary latch that is gonna be easy to unlatch. <laughs> and I don't wanna re reach around that tire in order to do it. So what I'm thinking is that we mount a trigger down here somehow that is gonna then have a cable that unlatches something behind the tire. I think that's gonna be the best way for us to have our cake and eat it too. And yes, that means that there's a second step. So unlatch this, unlatch that, and then it swings open. But I don't think that that's that big of an inconvenience considering that we're gonna gain a ton of extra strength and reduce the amount of wiggle in this. So let's say we undo our secondary latch, we open this bad boy up, and then we get a cold drink or whatever it is that we need. I wanna make sure that whenever we close this, we don't have like, you know, some weird cheat code we have to do in order to get it to close. I don't want to have to like hold the trigger open in order for this to relatch on that upper portion. So basically I wanna be able to just close this to where it is right now and then redo our bottom latch, that's it. And I think that the best way for me to do this without too much compromise is gonna be use a truck bed latch system. This is something I ordered on Amazon. This is a latch that is for like a GM tailgate. So like something that you'd find on like an Escalade or something you'd find on like a Silverado. And I'm just going to work this in an orientation that is gonna make it so it's gonna automatically latch itself shut whenever we close that, that tire carrier. And then I'm gonna use a bike brake handle <laughs> and a universal cable kit in order to make it to where I can remotely unlatch this. So that should be pretty convenient, shouldn't be too bad. And then whenever we shut the carrier, it should latch itself. So this is gonna take a little bit of fab work, a little bit of creativity, but I think that this is something that's very possible. Amazon actually has a lot of different latch options like this one, and I was lucky enough that for 30 bucks, I got two latches, so I'm gonna be able to carry a spare in case this thing ever fails on a really long trip, and I need to just bolt a new one on to get me home until I can engineer around the problem. If any of you guys are interested in the parts that I used in this video, I will definitely put together an Amazon shopping cart that will include the latch system, the cable system, and even the bike handle. This belt grinder from Ameribraid has different sized wheels so you can cope pipe and tube to make it to where it'll fit really nice and tight. I was able to use the inch and three quarter wheel to make sure that I have a nice tight fit between my handle mount and the tube. The opposing anchor point to this latch system is just as important as the latch system itself. 
Luckily for me, I have a door that was originally manufactured strong enough so you could put a spare tire directly on it, and we've already built a great mount that we can attach to to make sure that we have a solid connection. This is starting to come together and the upper latch is latched. I'm pulling really hard and that bad boy does not want to budge at all, which I really like. So let's give it a little test run. If we want to open this, I've got a little bit of fine tuning to do on the lower latch, but one, if we want to open it, we open that one and the upper one is still holding it tight. And as you can see, it's just a bolt that goes down into this jammy. It's just a random bolt that I had laying around in the shop. I'm going to exchange it out for a metric bolt uh, that'll make that just a tightly, as a slightly tighter fit, but right now it's doing okay. And then if we want to open up this portion, which we do, we just hit that little trigger. Super, super simple, right? I don't know the strength of this long term. This is all completely experimental, but I think that we're on to something. I think we're on the right track. The next step is going to be building a gusset that fits down in here and then uh, building a piece of steel that is going to go into, it'll basically be a strike pad for this weird little um, rubber bushing that's on here because that's going to help keep constant tension on this to reduce the amount of uh, noise that we're going to get out of this tire carrier. But the placement of this latch I think is going to really help reduce noise, really help reduce the wiggle. And uh, I'm very confident moving forward that we're, we're on to something good here. Now, if you watched close, you saw me just take a, a random nut and bolt combination that I had laying in the back of the shop, drilled a hole all the way through it, and then I step drilled it uh, one size bigger for the bottom side of this cable and whenever I unthread it I can actually tighten this so it's adjustable. I made like an adjustable mounting nut. Some might think that that's ghetto but I think that it works really well. This is stuff that I have laying around. It's free to me so I like that and I don't have any doubt that this is going to last a long time. I don't think that that giant nut is going to break anytime soon. So in order to close it, boom, we are latched. It's that simple. So now we just need to latch the lower side and our 37 is going to now want to stay on the disco instead of eject from the back of the disco. I popped off those two little gussets on the sides and I think that it looks way better without those little side gussets. It's a lot cleaner. So I just kind of buzzed everything clean and I'm happy with the way that turned out. I'm also happy with the, the way the weird latch mechanism turned out today. I, I like Frankenstein parts. <laughs> I like it when you can take things that are not necessarily automotive related and you can adapt them to the automotive space. Um, I bet you're not gonna well, you might in the future, but I bet you haven't seen something like this before. <laughs> some of you guys aren't going to like it. I think some of you guys are going to love it. I think it's awesome. And it opened up a lot of doors in my mind of how to engineer latches in the future. I think that if I was going to do this again, I'd probably have um, some sort of a, a trigger like this that would undo two latches with cables. I think that, that's, I think that there's, there's something here. There's a lot more that can be improved with this design in the future. And as I build stuff like this in the years to come, uh, you're definitely gonna see stuff like this pop back up because I'm very fascinated with the idea of using cables in order to remotely undo latches. Don't know why I haven't used this kind of thing before, but I'm definitely going to in the future. Anyway, the table turned out cool. A lot of this stuff is finally coming together. Um, 
I want to do a little bit more aluminum armor in the next video. I want to do that rear window in the next video. If I can find material, I got some aluminum. My, my the, the yard that I usually go to didn't have the thickness that I wanted. So I got some stuff that's a little bit too thick and now I'm backing out of the idea of using that stuff. So between now and the next video, I'm going to try to locate the right material that I need. I need to get some hardware. I, I'm going to be messing with the bumper a little bit, adding some stuff to make it look a little bit prettier. And then we're gonna pull everything off, we're gonna finish weld all of it, paint it, put it all back on. I'm pretty sure next video is gonna be the last one, but I've said that before, so who knows. Either way, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. Before we go, let's take a couple minutes, we'll answer some comments from the last video. The last video was Overland Tire Carrier Build Step 3, Unplanned Corner Armor. And the first question is from Austin P. For someone unable to build their own, what would a bumper slash carrier setup like this cost to have done? This is super close to what I would what I want for my 2000 P38. Unfortunately, you're not gonna like this answer. Before I give you a number, uh, let's just qualify this by saying, most people don't want to pay what it costs for a good fabricator to do good work. And that is why there it is so hard to find a good fabricator because people see videos of a guy like me doing it and they think that, oh, well, he, he does it so easy. I mean, it must you, you probably cost half of what it would cost to buy a poison spider bumper. But in fact, it would cost double because if you spend a thousand dollars on like a poison spider bumper, just like a JK bumper, for a guy to custom build that from scratch, it takes way more time. It takes a lot of time because you've got to go get all your materials. You're not doing it in an assembly. There's no jig to hook it up to and weld everything. So it's probably two grand for your average fabricator to build a simple bumper in comparison to if you went to somebody like Poison Spider and just got an off-the-shelf part. Now, when you're in a situation like us where we have Land Rovers, there are some options out there, but nothing like you see with Jeeps. And so the problem is we are stuck either building it ourselves, which is what I prefer, or you can pay a skilled craftsman to do this for you. If you pay a skilled craftsman to do this job, I would say it would start around four grand because you've got to think about all the time it takes just to get material, get bolts, um, make your plans, disassemble everything. You know, they're going to have to take a load to the dump to take all of your old stuff. So it all adds up is what I'm saying. And fabrication, when it's done right, is something that should be paid properly for. And when, you know, in my union, we have a saying, skilled labor isn't cheap and cheap labor isn't skilled. Next question is from Watch Channel. I'm super pumped for this build. I keep saying it, but I want you to know it's awesome. I'm uh, Thank you very much. I'm getting a pipe bender and gonna tackle some projects. Would it be possible for you to potentially build a front bumper down the road and show how those sliders are mounted? Thank you, God bless. So uh, I'll try to remember to do the slider thing. Since I didn't build these from scratch, uh, it might, we'll see, maybe. The front bumper is a definitely though. I wanna change out that front winch and the winch that I'm gonna put in there is super wide, super tall, it's a big winch. So I'm definitely gonna to have to change up that front bumper. In the future, you will absolutely see me build a front bumper, but before that, I wanna have, I'm very eager to get this on the trail and actually do some real wheeling with it and do some real overlanding with it. So it'll be a few months down the line before I decide to bite onto another project like that, but you will definitely see me build a front bumper for this disco on this channel. Next comment is from Old Grizz. Casey Cryan sounds like a frustrated wannabe fabricator. I got a bunch of these. Casey, I apologize, you know, it feels a little vindicating to talk to guys like you who I think gave me a short-sighted comment um, and then have a bunch of people pile on, but I also feel a little guilty because I'm in the limelight here, so I'm open target for people to just abuse, and I kind of pulled you into that, so I apologize. Also, <laughs> I'm gonna make this worse. I know I, I added another step because you did, we weren't very happy whenever I read your last comment about how I had to open up a latch in order to access those max tracks. Now it's double the work. There's two latches. Anyway, I'm just giving you a hard time, man. I hope that when you go through and you read these different comments from these people, uh, you don't take it too personal. It's all in good fun. I hope you decide to stick around on the channel. We'd love to have you. Um, so I will definitely stop picking on you starting now. HD Joe 3, odd question. Could you have used an old spindle and hub from front axle for the tire carrier pivot point? saw a post on IHateMud.com. Absolutely, this has been done so many times. The biggest disadvantage of uh, doing it that way is that if you decide to do it where you use a spindle and a hub from like a 44 or bigger, the spindles and hubs start to get kind of big for a tire carrier. Now, that being said, completely practical, 
be super strong. There's a lot of advantages of doing it. Also, it could be a spare part for you. So being able to have a spare, I had thought about doing this a long time ago. The pivot point is a spare spindle and hub, and then the mount for the tire, also a spare spindle and hub. So you have extra parts to work with in case you have an issue with your spindle or hub on the trail. So I do like that, but the diameter of it makes it to where you need to build a really fat bumper in order to make it not look just absolutely ridiculous. So for me, I like these smaller spindle kits because they're pretty dang strong, especially for the size, and it's much easier to incorporate them into your project. I hope you guys enjoyed the video and thank you very much to Empire Abrasives for being today's sponsor. So for those of you that are thinking of ways to help support the channel by supporting the people that support the channel, that is a big way that you can help us out. So if you are interested in buying anything from Empire Abrasives or from any of these other companies that sponsor these videos, you can click the link in our description. They have software that automatically can see where their traffic is coming from and it shows our sponsors that we are worth the investment. So if you guys plan on going to Empire Abrasives, make sure you use our portal, or if you know you want to shop on Amazon, you can use our Amazon portal. All of that stuff adds up and it makes it to where we can buy the materials and the camera gear and whatnot to do these videos. If you wanna help support us in other ways, of course, you can go to our website. We have t-shirts, hats, neck gaiters, decals, all that stuff. And uh, we also have a link to our Patreon account there as well. If you wanna follow me on social media, I'm at Dirt Lifestyle Nate. We'll see you next time. <laughs>